there's some schools and some disciplines where people come up with theories, they spend a lot of time on theories, and they try to create experiments or they write, create grants or RFPs to test the theory. And then when they test the theory and reality doesn't work, they don't question the theory, they question reality or the experiment. And I think that the internet and the media lab are very the opposite. You just do something, even if you don't really know what you're looking for, but if it works, then you try to figure out why it works. And practice over theory, I think, is, is, is really kind of a, another way of um, expressing the kind of agility that we're working on. Um, I think disobedience is very important. Um, I remember when I was hanging out with Timothy Leary um, towards the end of his life, the one takeaway from him that I really love was he always used to say, question authority and think for yourself. And that gets back to this learning and education thing, which is really difficult. You, it's very difficult to teach people to think for themselves. You know, because because there's knowledge and there's understanding. And and because you don't get a Nobel Prize for doing what you're told. You get a Nobel Prize for questioning the fundamental authority of the field that you're in and flipping it over. And you can't ever flip a field over if you're just doing as you're told. You always have to be questioning authority. And so it doesn't mean you have to be disrespectful to authority, but questioning authority in the right way is an essential part of creativity and innovation. And, I th and that's really, really hard to teach because it's a culture. And I think it's, it also ties to the difference between understanding and knowledge and, and mastery and knowledge. I mean, I, I, again, not to beat up on any particular discipline, but there are a lot of disciplines, for instance, I, I'm, in, I'm very much into entrepreneurship. There are a lot of disciplines that are about the study of entrepreneurship. And they will read and read and talk and talk about entrepreneurship. But you really kind of have to, it's a combination. It's good to be able to pull back and do self-reflection. But it's kind of like reading all these books about skiing, but never getting on the slopes, and then thinking that you can ski, and you realize you can't. And it's useful once you started skiing to read the books and things like that, so I'm not discounting the value of that. But like, I don't, I don't, and, and, uh, again, this is just a thing that I, I've paralleled that, that I love. I used to snowboard a lot more than I, used to, I do now, but when you're on a snowboard and you're going through a really tight turn, the minute you think you're going to fall, you fall. The edge catches and you fall. But if you visualize yourself going through, you usually make it through because it really is about um, this kind of relaxing into it and not getting tense. And I've had the exact same experience in several companies where you're going nose down into like a bankruptcy one week before bankruptcy and you'll see all these people freak out and leave the company. But the people who have been through it a few times, well, yeah, you may fall, you're not going to die. You just cruise through and most of the time you actually make it because it always looks worse than it actually is if you know what you're doing. And, and that kind of sort of, it's, it's almost a physical experience and, and the reason I would, I, like the first 10 years of my life, was, all of my companies were failures. And I wasn't a particularly good business person, but once you fail enough, you sort of start to understand what it feels like. And you also understand that you can fail and go into debt, and then you just spend three years digging yourself out of debt, but you can pop back out, and then you can survive. You know? and, and, and so, so once you have that, sort of the bottom is really not that bad, you become fearless. The only problem is as you get older, then you have other people that you have to take care of, so you end up with responsibility. So there's, I think there's a, there's a sweet spot in taking risks. But anyway, getting, getting back to, to the, the principles. So I think being able to take risk is really important. And a really key part about risk taking is that the cost of innovation has gone down tremendously. So you've got Moore's Law, you've got the internet allowing you to collaborate and distribute with, uh, with nearly no cost. And then you have open source and free software. So if you think about Google, if you had done this pre-internet, pre-CCITT, you would have, so just some Japanese telephone company would have probably spent a billion dollars, taken 10 years, and it wouldn't have worked. Instead, you have a couple of kids who just have, buy a little PC, put Linux on it, connect it to the internet, and they, it works, right? So the cost of innovation went from a billion dollars to actually nearly zero to get a minimum viable product. So, so in the old days when I started um, working, I still remember what, before internet, to start a project, you know, software project, I bet, I'm, I can't think of a good one, but you know, probably AutoCAD or something, probably cost 10 to 100 million dollars to get to the point where the product was shippable. 
So what you do is you'd hire an MBA and you sit and write a business plan and you go raise 10 to 100 million dollars and then you would come up with a product map, you'd hire the people and you build the thing. So, so venture capital and, 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 and still in many fields it's this way where you have to have a plan, then you raise the money, then you hire the people and you build the thing. But if you look, if you look at Facebook, Yahoo, Flickr, Twitter, um, um, Google, it's a bunch of engineers who build the thing first then they raise the money, and then they may figure out the business plan, right? And so it, it's completely reversed because the cost of trying something is now cheaper than the cost of actually even trying to figure it out. I, I invest approximately, my average is probably $100,000 per investment. So the most I will ever lose by investing in richest company is $100,000. So in a big company, you're sitting there mitigating risk because your upside is kind of incremental. You get market share here, you get a little margin there. But your downside is almost unlimited. The market could flip, your costs could overrun, you could, your budget can be, you know. So, so you're sitting there worrying about risk. And, and if you're a venture capitalist, especially today, working in consumer internet and software, um, the most you're going to lose is the money you put in. And so when an entrepreneur like last week calls me up and says, um, I don't, I'm going to run out of money, help me think about my business model, help me raise more money. I say, well, you're a great entrepreneur, the market didn't work, I'll help you with your next job but just close the company. I'm going to go over and work on Twitter in Japan to try to double their value because if you had invested, I think, $100,000 in Facebook in the first round, it'd be probably worth a billion dollars today. And what you're really trying to do as, an, as a venture capitalist is to bet on a lot of things. And I mean, this is kind of, everybody knows this, but, but in practice, it really is not about trying to go after Richard and say, I invested $100,000, give me that money. That's, that energy should be directed to the people who are going up. And if Richard's done a good job in this company, what I do is I find a company that's doing well, and I say, you know, he did an awesome job. Let's connect you guys. And, and, and so the, 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 you, you have to separate the failure because the number one category of people I like to recruit to companies that are successful are the people who did well in the companies that just failed. Because I know them, I trust them, and they're, they're, they're looking for the next thing. And so, so anyway, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning that is that, and then if you go all the way down this curve to oh, free and open source, I, I, lo I love this, to give this story because I, I was the first person to ever give Jimmy Wales and Wikipedia an award. This is, um, but, I remember when Wikipedia was just coming out, can you imagine if you were in some big company or some school and you said, I'm going to create the biggest encyclopedia in the world and the trick is anyone can edit it. You, know, you, you wouldn't have gotten money, you wouldn't have gotten a desk, but the thing that's great about the internet is you can try and, you, and even Linux, if you look at the post by Linus Torvalds on Usenet saying, you know what, I'm going to do this little kernel, it may or may not be interesting, there are probably a hundred things like that that week. And you could never have bet that Linus was going to be successful. And a lot of it is serendipity. I mean, I think um, one of our um, guys, uh, Mako, just did a study on, on all the other Wikipedias that happened that failed. You know, so it's not that Wikipedia as an idea was successful. There's a lot of reasons how it became successful. So, so, it, so serendipity is really important. Betting on things is important. You know, my, my, my first company, this ISP, I remember going to a Japanese trading company trying to get them to invest $600,000. They set up a feasibility study company, spent $3 million not to invest $600,000, you know. And so, so this is where I start talking about, I call it maps over compass, uh, compasses over maps. Because the cost and the accuracy of the map now exceeds the cost of actually just trying it. Right, and so this is what I think a dilemma that a lot of big companies get into is that they sit and just the cost, the value of all of you sitting around here for an hour is probably we could probably well, I, I you know some of my friends and I worked out that it probably costs about thirty thousand dollars to create a minimum viable product in the consumer internet space. So we could probably do like you know fifteen startups with the cost of you just sitting around and listening to this thing, and so. So really just sitting, and, and so that's, that's kind of an interesting math. The, the cost of trying to decide whether to invest or not should never exceed the cost of the investment. That's sort of my, one of my rules of thumb. But, but, but what's, what's important about the cost of innovation going down is it took the power away from these centralized R&D labs that had lots of money and pushed them to the edges, to the students, to the startups. And that was one of the problems with the East Coast, right? Because there are all these big companies who had money, and there was kind of the idea that if you had a startup, you're going to try to sell it to the big company. Whereas on the East Coast, they just built stuff. And the East Coast, even today, 
Huh? Uh, West Coast, sorry, West Coast. West Coast Silicon Valley venture capitalists, they don't like you hitching your wagon to a big company. I mean, this is, this is all cliche, but you know, Reed Hoffman always says it's, a startup is like throwing yourself over a cliff, funding is little thermal drafts, but you're basically trying to build your company before you hit the bottom. Other people say you're basically dead and you're trying to become alive. And, and the thing is that there's no risk that you can take um, that isn't worth it in a way because you're already dead, right? Whereas a big company is alive, trying to stay alive, and they're very methodical and slow. So the minute you hitch your wagon to a big company, your time scale and your incentives are opposite. And, and, and I always give this, I mean, I always think about like, and this is a kind of thing that I see at MIT and at the, and the West East Coast a lot that I'm trying to change. Is like, you come up with an idea, the first thing they try to do is get contracts with big companies. But even if you're in something like financial services, the customer, the user is out there, you should focus on the user because you're selling to some big company person who doesn't understand their customer and the product that you're selling may not have anything to do with what the customer wants. You could create something that goes directly to the customer and then this big company could buy you. But there's something about being kind of immersed in large companies. Um, it's the same with like advertising in Madison Avenue. You know, it's like you, you work with these old agencies who are treating th their customer as if they're suckers or something. And they have this whole pattern when the real disruptive people are the ones who are really looking at, well, what are the kids doing differently? Oh, they're not buying CDs. They're, you know. And so, so that, that, that's one of the things I think that the, East, the West Coast did really well, was really focus not on, the, on the, the big guys with the money, but really on the user. I think we still have an opportunity to change some of this, but, but that's sort of... But getting back to the sort of nature of risk, so as the cost of innovation goes down, the, the, the ventures, um, startups get a lot of energy. And the West Coast VCs really focus on consumer and software because they scale very well, they leverage um, assets and stuff like that. They, the West Coast folks haven't done a lot of hardware and haven't done a lot of biotech. Um, hardware because there's a lot of um, funny upfront costs in hardware and biotech because the cost of the regulatory things are really high. Um, I do think that we are getting to a point where um, the, the Moore's Law is gonna hit both hardware and software. So what you see right now is with all of the 3D printing and the, um, and the CNC machines, the cost of prototyping is going way down. So we can build just about anything in the media lab. You can go over to MakerBot guys. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. And now the Chinese um, manufacturing is getting very, very easy to manage because you've got all these intermediary supply chain companies like PCI International and others. So I do think that the, the way that the, 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 what do you call it, the cost and risk profile of hardware companies is starting to look a lot more like um, internet companies in that you can push the prototyping and the manufacturing risk off onto other other players. So I think that actually literally this year is going to be the year that um, hardware startups are going to pop. And because West Coast VCs have kind of been traditionally unhappy or not really into hardware because it was not as not as scalable as software, I think we do have an opportunity on the East Coast. And there's a lot of stuff going on in New York right now with, um, I have a couple, a couple companies here. There's um, Limor Freed and Adafruit, who's one of our um, um, graduates. But I think hardware is, is going to be a, and, and, and just look at the statistics like, or the data. HP that has these four or five year roadmaps is getting out of hardware. And then you see Microsoft, um, Google, and maybe Facebook getting into hardware. So the agile guys are getting into hardware. The people who don't have the ability to have agility are getting out of hardware. But now the next pivot after the big software companies, internet companies going to hardware is gonna be, or you know, you have Barnes and Noble and Amazon too. You're gonna have these startups really aggressively going into hardware. So I think that's a big deal. And I think that that's something that this sort of New York East Coast is, um, is good at. The, the other one I think is biotech. So um, I don't know how much you followed um, so we've sequenced a lot of genes, but we're not really good at printing them. So if you're, you know, so Pfizer or Mars, you go to China and you get a factory with six or seven hundred people, and they sit there and they hand sequence or hand generate the genes. So it's you have about a um, one error per hundred base pairs. And so if you think about what the parallel for that is, is in the old days with electronics, um, you couldn't make electronic devices with transistors more complex than two or three thousand transistors per device because you had a yield problem because you're building them by hand and you get you'd introduce errors and the yield would go down too much but with the integrated circuit what happened was you were able to decrease the errors increase the production rate and suddenly the complexity that you can put onto a computer chip increased geometrically and that's how Moore's law happens 
Well, so we've now got with, there's a variety of different technologies, but with microfluidics and also with CMOS chips, um, at the Media Lab, Joe Jacobson, who did e-ink, has created this company called Gen9, which is now using CMOS to print genes. We're down to one error per 10,000 base pairs. That's probably going to go up in order of magnitude very soon. We will have half of the world's gene fabrication capacity in the Media Lab, well, in Kendall Square, within a, within a year. And it completely breaks the whole barrier in terms of the, t the sophistication of the biological devices. It's scary too, but, but, there's, but, there's a, but, it, but it does bring Moore's law to biology. The problem is that the main cost now of innovation is the, um, the, is the FDA and the testing. And so the regulatory cost is really high. We do need to work out how to automate that and reduce the regulatory cost. But the a little bit scary part of this is that it may, a lot of this innovation may end up in countries where they have less regulation. And so. So that's another area that I'm interested in. But to now just pivot a little bit to the media lab. So I've been talking a lot about these basic principles of kind of practice over theory, build. It turns out that the media lab has the same DNA. So even though the media lab was created 35 years ago, before we had, um, what was it? It was, about, it was 1984, 85, 85 I think. Um, and it was Nicholas Negroponte had written being digital, it was about the personal computer was just coming out, internet was before internet, so it was really about man-machine interface, empowering the individual, and creating these objects, and just sort of the birth of consumer electronics. Um, and, and that, but, but in that space, they, they had a very similar um, philosophy. And that, the, the difference now, and this is one of the things I'm trying to, the, and the students and the faculty have already sort of moved in this direction, but as an as a institution I'm trying to change, is that now it's no longer about products. It's not about making the next sharper image catalog. It's about these ecosystems, because it's networks now. And instead of individuals, we're talking about societies and communities. Um, instead of this container, this ivory tower thing that's maybe the Media Lab, we need to turn it into a network. So I'm going to try to get fellows and, and expand and connect with lots of people. And it's not just about working with large companies that can afford $200,000 a year. We need to start working with all different kinds of people, nonprofits, philanthropists, the arts. I mean, and, and our program is called Media Arts and Science. And it's this real synthesis between design and engineering, arts and science. And Richard mentioned the word antidisciplinary. We just did a, a faculty search. And I can't believe that MIT let us use antidisciplinary as a requirement for our faculty. Um, because what that means is that we're, we're looking for people, if you can do whatever you want to do in any other school or any other discipline, you don't belong here. And so if you look at all of the people who applied, I, I, can, I don't know if any of them actually were applying anywhere else. I mean, and, like at, and our students, you know, we have um, about a 95% yield. And that's because most of the students who apply to the Media Lab aren't applying anywhere else. They're the misfits of society. They're the kids who can't fit in anywhere else, who want to learn how to... So like one of the students I was just talking to yesterday, she's trying to do the intersection between performance art, chemistry, and gastronomy. You know, and, and you can't do that in normal places. And, 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 and that's why we're, not, we're also not interdisciplinary. Because interdisciplinary sort of suggests that you've got physicists and archaeologists and chemists working together. But our kids are... They do all of that together, and it's very difficult. Design is built into everyone's mind, and by the time you leave, you leave in this in, in this a very different state. So, um, and it's probably because of that, it's, it's the only place where you would have a college dropout um, lab director. Um, but 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 I think what's important as you as we think about the role of the media lab and the role of this kind of thinking in in large institutions and in America today, it's. I think it's a lot about, we were talking a little bit about serendipity, but it's also about peripheral vision. Because, I don't know, have any of you ever gone mushroom hunting? I don't know. No, there's a few. When I'm in Europe, it's like everyone. But, um, but when you go mushroom hunting, if you're successful, you know that like, when you focus, your field of view is actually only about 1%. Everything else is sort of cognitively filled in with your brain. So when you mushroom hunt, you can't like, look for mushrooms. You have to kind of pull back and be focused. This is the same with game hunting and stuff like that. And then suddenly you see the motions, you see the patterns. And so it's interesting because we, it, in, in the Western world, focus so much on the importance of execution and focus and focus and focus. But it turns out focus takes away your peripheral vision. There's a study that shows that if you put a dot on the screen and you put peripheral vision pictures in the periphery, you'll see them. But the minute you give somebody, I'll give you 10 bucks to wash it up, it disappears. Right? Um, there's another really interesting study that I saw, which is if you, um, they did a study where they, in the newspaper, they, they um, 
collected people who were either thought they were super unlucky or super lucky. And they put them in a room and made them read a newspaper. And they asked them to count the number of photos in the newspaper. And then in big headline fonts it says, if you tell the examiner you get $250,000, uh, no, $250. And another one said, there are 42 pictures in this newspaper. So all the lucky people obviously saw this and just went up. So give me 250 bucks and there's 42 pictures. All the unlucky people kept <laughs> counting all the photos. And the thing about luck and serendipity is you kind of have to be looking for it. And if you're so focused, you can't. And what the Media Lab is trying to do th through this kind of practice over theory and this ability to be very giving yourself permission to be creative is to try to become the peripheral vision for big companies. And even if you're in a big company or even if you're in a department, you are kind of forced to focus. And I used to have, it's kind of like meditating it's, and, and mushroom hunting. I, I remember I had a yoga teacher who I was learning to meditate from and he said, Joe, just don't think about elephants. And then and that's all you think about, right? So it's kind of like if you're in a big company and they say, all right, you must be creative, just don't think about the bottom line. You know, you, that's what you're going to be thinking about. And so what the Media Lab is, in a, in a funny way, and this gets back to this whole idea of how do you teach kids to question authority and think for themselves. You don't do it by ordering them to question authority and think for themselves. And I remember in Singapore there was like this policy that everyone must be creative, you know. And, and we, we've tried this in Japan. It doesn't really work, right? You've got to kind of figure out how do you teach that sort of thing. And so that's what we're trying to teach our students. That's what we're trying to teach the companies that we work with. But it's also, I think, becoming exceedingly important. But you need to switch back and forth, right? You don't want the mushroom hunter to be completely unfocused when they're driving you back home, right? And, and similarly, I think it's the ability to kind of switch back between modes, which is really important, and to interface with the real world. And so, you know, so I, I think of the media lab as this kind of place where we're trying to create this little um, sort of. Com and, and, and by the way, so the, most of our funding comes from corporate sponsors that give it to us in a completely undirected funding pool. So. They can't, and we don't, tell our students or faculty what to do, which is very, very different from the rest of MIT or the rest of the world, where you write a grant proposal and you get money to do the thing. But that means you already know the answer before you start. Most of the people who work in the media lab don't know what they're looking for until they get there. Right? And also, we, we, I mean, we, some of our faculty like scholarship, but generally speaking, we don't emphasize scholarship, because even peer review, in a way, is incremental. The fact that you can explain it to five different people means you know it and understand it well enough to be able to articulate it. But that means you're not really discovering it as you go along. It means you've discovered something that you're trying to prove, right? And this is, again, theory over practice. And so, again, not everything should be practice over theory. But there's a lot of stuff that you'll never figure out. And, and, and I talked, I'm on two foundation boards, and I Foundation MacArthur, but I just gave a talk at the foundation executive group, which is all the big foundation presidents. And I said, you know, it's really, really awful because so many foundations come up with a theory and then they create a program and they create metrics, like maybe we should measure the success of libraries by book circulation. But then what you're doing is reinforcing libraries as you know, book warehouses, when actually maybe libraries should be encouraged to become learning centers. And the only way you really push that is to find the really creative librarian and say, do whatever you want, here's some money. And then you figure out, hey, what happened? Something really cool happened. And then you try to investigate. And that kind of discovery through undirected research, undirected funding, I think, in every single thing, whether you're in a company or in a foundation or in a school, I think is, can't be everything. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's 3%, Google thinks it's 20%, but it's some percentage of your energy needs to be devoted to sort of discovery, peripheral vision, and questioning authority. And so with that, we'll go to conference. Thank you. Well, I was certainly hard to know where to begin with Q&A. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to do a few questions and sort of extracting from, mostly throwing away my prepared questions. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one, one of the general themes, uh, your skiing example reminded me of, uh, there was a book, Inner Tennis, long ago, which spawned a series, Inner Skiing, and mm -hmm. it talked about self one versus self two, where one is the self that thinks about, you know, I should move my racket here, I have to do this, I have to follow through. Mm -hmm. And then self two is the one that just knows how to play. And that if you put, if you get self one out of the way, you can... Continue with the question that I had to work if, with. If you get self two out of the way, then then you can play better. So that's, a, you know, that ties in with your focus on serendipity. Uh, but it, uh, it also, 
get so so the question I guess is do you have any suggestions on how to get to a better integration mm -hmm. of those um, yeah so I can't remember which one you said was self one and self two, but I, I, I think that it's important to be reflective, but I think it's important to kind of start before you really know what you're doing. Because I think the minute you create a plan, you, it, 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 once you let your, I'm going to use left brain, right brain, even though it's not completely accurate, but it's, it's an easy metaphor. I mean, if you let your left brain, your symbolic planning brain kick in, um, it really does tend to crowd out your more creative side of your brain. It's just it's just your ego st strong and you and especially in today's society I think you tend to want to do things that you can explain um, and so I think you really want to really start with the experience and then after you fail you you, you, you come back and, and, you, and you, you reflect and so to me even what if whether you're starting a company like when I first started a company I knew nothing you know and I failed like really badly and, but this is also basically partially personality I suppose but but once you fail then you've got a, a lot of emotion and structure that then you're trying to understand but but you put your cognitive model together very differently when you've got something to work with I think the problem is if you do the, the, the cognitive model before the experience, you're trying to fit the experience into the cognitive model and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it, it's, it's going to be very, very different. And um, I don't know if I'm answering that problem. I think the other problem today is that, um, the, and John C. D. Brown talks about this, but the world is really, really different than it was a little while ago. And it's continuing to be different. And I think that the, the inter, whether it's user interfaces for video games and life, but the the cognitive models that we have to think about how we do things um, haven't kept up with. Um, I, don't, I think most of us really don't have the cognitive models to really understand the complexity and the speed in which the world is working. I think the kids have the ability to kind of get that intuitively. And then I think our academics and our words and our structure is going to catch up to that. I, don't, I think right now academics and even just like like economics, take economics. Economics completely fails today in trying to predict or to, to do anything about the economy. And you have lots of stuff going on. You have, you have traders who kind of intuitively get it. You've got the quants who kind of mathematically get it. But there, it hasn't yet become a discipline. And I think that by the time, the, the disciplines are lagging. And so what, what John C. Brown said at one of these meetings that we were at where, with a bunch of economists where we were talking about innovation, he said, you know what? We can change all of these formulas and all these models all we want, but we're not going to get the answer because we're using the wrong cognitive models. And, and to me, cognitive models come a lot through experience. And I think that what's going to happen is, what's, it's, again, practice over three, I think people are going to experience stuff, and then they're going to try to explain what they're experiencing, and that's going to create the new disciplines and the new languages. Now, related to that, it seems like there's sort of an inherent conflict that this is almost like a totally new model, yet there's all these institutions and big companies that are the way they are. So how do you see a coexistence or a gradual you know, cooperative movement toward a more open approach? Uh, um, so, so this is a tricky question because I am on the board of the New York Times. And, uh, um, but, you know, it's, it's so, you know, the, the, the the railways didn't become the airlines, you know, and a lot of people say, oh, I'm in the transportation business, but they're all really different models. Um, and I think that the tricky part is whether you can get a company um, to, to pivot. And I think the, the little internet companies that, ha you know, pivot every week are able to change their identity from a dating site with video to video for Flickr to, you know, YouTube, like, um, but... I think for these larger institutions, it's really difficult. I do think some institutions are able to pivot. I mean, you've seen GE and IBM and some of these large institutions pivot. And it requires, it, it's not impossible, it requires a lot of energy. Um, but I think that the, the, the interface, if you look at how um, um, Google and others are doing it, is they, they, are, they do realize that the innovation is on the edges. They acquire and interact with a lot of startups. Um, and they're trying to use their scale to create a platform around <coughs> excuse me around which a lot of the innovation occurs and trying to keep plugged into the system and i think one of the things that's going to be essential and, but but you know there's a there's a, a lot of it has to do with um what do we call it it's a um a uh, it's a i don't know if the right word is respect but like for, for me so for, for example i'm an early stage um investor I, I haven't invested since i started the media lab but started at the media lab but the when i was investing a lot 
Um, the average investment rounds of the companies I was looking at were a couple hundred thousand dollars. So there was never enough room for all the money that wanted to go in. And so in order to be a good investor, you had to work really hard. Your money was just a placeholder for the amount of equity you would get in exchange for the work you put in. I mean, these are, assuming you're investing in good companies. And you weren't sitting back saying, hey, I've got money, and acting like the big man. You were, you were really hustling to try to explain to the entrepreneur how much value we're going to add. And so the entrepreneur had a lot more power because if you need less money to do stuff, money isn't as important. And so the investors are really participants and they're, they're, they're partners. In big companies or when you're investing in big investments where people need a lot of money, the people with the money have a lot of power. So they kind of kick back and, and, and they act important. Right? And I think that the relationship with large companies and small companies is kind of similar. I think in a lot of Silicon Valley companies, they realize Time innovating. They need these innovators on the outside and so they treat them with a tremendous amount of respect and they, they are always trying to help them. And I think one of the things that a lot of the East Coast companies, the good ones are getting but need to get more is there is still kind of like, like again I'm going to do a horrible vast, horrible stereotyping but like the, the, the companies that I've invested in that, I've, that have been successful whether it's like Twitter and the kids at Twitter or if you look at um, um, Last FM, they're not impressive kids in, in the sense that impressive in East Coast, old school East Coast, is like people that look like they can sell a lot of enterprise software, have, you know, have tidy suits and have, like, have a strong handshake. Man, he's an impressive looking entrepreneur. He looks like a good salesman, right? And, and that's not the kind of people who make these really awesome consumer internet companies. And, 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 it's, and it has a lot to do with the, the creative spark. But if you look in Silicon Alley and you look at the kids that are hanging out doing startups here, they, you've got those kids here, but they're still, having, they're still being treated by these big companies like a bunch of punks sometimes. And, 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 and I think the smart companies are changing, but, but you, you had a comment? No, that's <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and it is, I don't know if it's, it's not Harvard or anything like that, but there is definitely kind of a, a class system on the East Coast that I think stifles the ability for the, the kids to get the respect that they want. And then they go to Stanford or to the West Coast and everybody treats them. I mean, you, you see, you see um, Mark Zuckerberg with his hoodie, you know, and, and that's fine over there. You know, in, in New York, they kind of th think you're weird. So, so that, but that, that can change, I think. Okay, I'll follow that up with one and then open it up to the, to the group. The, the follow-up is media in particular. It seems like there's the mainstream old media that are very against innovation and basically fighting it tooth and nail in a lot of respects, and then all these startups who are sort of stealing their lunch. Do you think that the big companies are going to pivot uh, more than you know one or two of them, yeah. or is it going to be the little guys that just sort of blow them away? Well, I think the little guys are going to be the guys that um, are innovative, that show that things could be different. I think the smart big ones will work with those little guys. I think it's hard for that innovation to happen internally, but the, the big guys are definitely going to be watching them and working with them. Um, and, the, and the media is kind of a broad word, right? I mean, at the Media Lab, I call gene sequences and robots, or anything you can express yourself in, I consider it as media. But then inside of media, you have journalism and you have entertainment, which are very, very different, right? And so the reason I'm, I'm working at the New York Times is I think journalism is, professional journalism is important and I don't think, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of citizen journalism and blogging and things like that, but I still, when I read the Pulitzer Prize and the nominations that come out every year from the New York Times, I realize, you know, they're sending in, you know, people to spend a year trying to go through the taxes of GE to, you know, figure out that whether they paid taxes or not. And you're not going to, you can't do that, you know, just as, as an amateur. I mean, you need, so, so until we figure out another model, I think that we need to sort of protect professional journalism and we need to iterate on that. It's, to me, I feel like that's a function of democracy, which is a, it's a very different thing than kind of the future of um, music and entertainment, which is also media. I think that the future of music and entertainment, I think, is going to be completely blown away by lots of models. I I feel like a lot of this innovation is going to come from outside of America. I mean, even today you see Spotify and Last FM coming from Europe just because the collection society is a little bit more flexible. But if you look at Brazil, for instance, um, you know, Tecnobrega and, and, um, and Baofunk and some of these new genres, um, they actually don't 
um, go after copyright. They give all the music to these street vendors. They listen to the music. I used to be a disc jockey. I used to listen to 300 songs a, a month just to try to chart my records. It was a chore listening to hundreds and hundreds of crappy songs to pick the five that you liked. That's not fun. You wouldn't want to pay for that. And so in, in, in Brazil, they figured out, okay, that's the crappy part of the job. We're going to give that music away for free. And then when you find the three or four bands that you like, the big promoters double down on them, do these huge shows where they have tens of thousands of people showing up, paying you know, 50 bucks to get in, and they make millions of dollars a month. And they realize that the music selection, the music attention process, now that you don't have MTV and a monopoly and the ability to force everybody to think that they like Madonna, it's once you have distrib distributed sources and you have real competition, then to be, you know, to, 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 to be known is a huge cost. And so today, the music industry is so focused on this. That Anyway, I'm gonna, it's the long run, but the short version is if you look at the, the and this is my whole point about con consumer focus, all right, well, you realize that the value is not in that part where you listen to crappy songs. The value is in the part where you show up with your friends and go to the show, and then maybe buy the T-shirt and the DVD later. Okay, well, let's make money on this and make this part easier. That's kind of obvious, but when you're structured in a way that's, that you only have the rights to this part and you don't have the rights to this part, you can't fix it. And so I do think there's going to be a lot of leapfrogging in the media industry um, from a lot of these emerging markets where, where they don't... And even China, if you look at the music industry in China, because they don't spend money investing in musicians, you do see a lot more talented singer-songwriters that last 30 years. Whereas Jap Japan and Taiwan, it's all promoted. What you do is you try to get people who aren't good at music, because then you don't have to pay them very much, and then you get a return on your investment. In Japan, I remember I was working, you could pay $2 million to get your song of your artist put on as the, first, as the theme song for the most popular TV show. And you would always, this is a little bit different now, but you'd always get your money back. And the artist was only paid a little tiny stipend because they knew they couldn't go anywhere else and be, you know. And it was this really screwed up model where it was just completely commercial. And so in that way, I think a lot of places that have infrastructure are going to take a lot, little, lot, lot longer. Um, we have some mics around. Uh, I think we have mics. Get the guy out. Uh, Mike, no Mike. Okay, may I? I can't believe you mentioned Brazil because I'm, I'm just involved in Brazil right now. I'm sort of disruptive in what I do. I'm, I'm on the legal side. I deal with rights, um, content. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about Brazil is... My name is Robert Rosenbach. The interesting thing about Brazil, you mentioned where nobody's on the radar. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I want to do is just ask this question, kind of a micro, micro approach to a larger issue. So as soon as you become on the, as soon as you get on the radar in Brazil, careful what I say. <laughs> yeah, we're streaming, you, you I think. Have one of, you have one of the, well, if you look up uh, the Performing Rights Society in Brazil, uh -huh. that, that control your right to use music, yeah. not only compositions, but phonograms. Mm -hmm. It, it's full of indictments mm -hmm. and, and totally unregulated. And there's a big war going on right now. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile? Uh, you know, this is all going on with crappy music, you said. Yeah. But but once you get on the radar, you have a hugely repressive um, and, and highly controlling mm -hmm. uh, uh, performing rights organization. Yeah. It's not ASCAP. It's not BMI. Yeah. They're pretty much the same. Yeah, now and, I'm in a lot of trouble. Yeah, and I and that's why Sony doesn't make any money in Brazil, because there yeah there is an element where I think what well, Brazil does have a lot of issues, and I think that if you deal with the people who around where there are rights, I think that there, it, it it is it is very complicated, and I think that what I'm looking at are those models on the fringes that try to stay under the radar. Um, and, they, and then they, they, they are great examples of how, the, how underground economies and subcultures can happen. But I, but I, do, but I do agree. Um, a lot of this is Brazil, but it's, a lot of this is the, the sort of Hollywood push to try to build into um, a lot of the trade agreements, the, the enforcement of this stuff, and then it starts to create this own little um, world of its own. And, and I, when I'm in the Middle East and I, I see... Um, you know, um, more police being s used to crack down on um, um, software and music rights than on um, terrorism um, or just crime. 
it's kind of disgusting, you know. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny. It, 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 it's true. It, there, there's a lot of that all over the world. Um, I work with a lot of these rights organizations, and some some of them are are actually, um, you know, in in Europe we find a lot of progressive. Um, collections agencies, but yeah, the, in, in, in a lot of countries, they, they are kind of screwed up, and we try to avoid them where we can. Uh, Pete Wessel, uh, there's a saying that, that goes something like, uh, uh, in the beginner's mind, there's a world of possibilities, and in the expert's mind, there's none. And so um, I was wondering if uh, some of what you're saying is, you know, to live outside your comfort zone, or be uh, more comfortable with failure, those types of things. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that advice or yeah. fair? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I grew up between U.S. and Japan, and I was never comfortable in my childhood because I would, didn't fit into either. And then I got kind of comfortable, and then I realized I wasn't learning anything. And so I'd always been pushing myself out of my comfort zone. And when I became comfortable um, in U.S. and Japan, I moved to Dubai and started exploring the Middle East because that was really uncomfortable. And um, and I always realized I was learning, and failure is not fun. I mean, you never, you never get comfortable with failure. I mean, it's always kind of painful, but you do realize that if you really enjoy learning, um, you, you learn by, 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 at least for me. I mean, and, and again, your mileage may vary, because my sister and I grew up in a very similar environment, but she was straight A, Harvard, Stanford, double PhD, magna cum laude, and she's very smart, she's very happy with her life and we we talk and we're friends and everything like that but but she she took a very different formal education world so i think it de depends on your personality too like i'm just huh and you're the one who's heading up the i know it is kind of ironic right but but well that's i realized that what's the most out of my comfort zone now probably being in academia um but um <laughs> but 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 it, but but it is it, it, I think it, it is it is because I was one of those people who I people couldn't tell me something and I, I would never believe it and you say hey you're gonna fall well, let me try and then you fall and then you realize okay maybe but um, but but I, I do I do I do think it, it depends on the person and I think everybody has different types of um, risk appetite I have a very high risk appetite and. Um, and so that I, I don't. So and, and just on that note, I mean, I I think Peter Thiel's th position um, about trying to sort of saying dropping out of college is good. He doesn't actually say that, but he kind of implies that. I think that's actually not true. I think that there are probably three or four people every year for whom it was the right decision to drop out of college. For most people, you're going to make less money, especially if you're a woman or a, or a minority. You'll make less money if you don't graduate. And if you don't have a good idea, you, you should graduate. I, and, and I always tell my students, if I were at the media lab, I would have graduated. But, um, but, I, but I do think that, um, having said that, it's like you were saying, that the, 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 the fearless entrepreneurs are, are not experts. And, and if it weren't for them, you would never get this kind of disruptive stuff because there's always a reason why something's not going to work. But it's only through push, pushing through. And, and, and I think about a lot of this in just general creativity. Like if you're, and I, I see this a lot in the Japanese kids. It's like if you sit, just imagine you're sitting on a weekend in the bathtub and you come up with an idea. The real sort of creative entrepreneur is going to say, you know, this may be the first... I, I may be the first person, person who have ever thought of this, and probably isn't, but they, they'll think that, and they'll spend the whole weekend trying to build this thing, you know. And and if they're wrong, the next week, I mean, like Sean Fanning is a good friend. Every single weekend that I, when he doesn't have a project, he, he creates another amazing idea, and he sends it to me by email. The average kid says, "Oh, somebody's probably already thought of that," and I'm not that smart anyway. And and they say, "Okay, well, what am I going to watch on TV?" You know, and and it's really this very self-limiting thing, and. Not all of your ideas are going to be smart, but it's whether you give yourself permission to spend the whole day thinking about that idea or you're limiting yourself. To follow up on that, one of the things that, that struck me is uh, I think it's the president of Stanford talked about one of the roles in the online education world is credentialing. Mm -hmm. That it's no longer teaching because people learn, as you say, and the role of a university is to credential. Yeah. So I, I, well, first of all, our degree is called media arts and science, and so just between us, um, it doesn't really mean anything, right? So as, as, I mean, in, in that people don't have job listings for PhDs in media arts and science. I mean, it means something, but it doesn't really mean a lot. So I always tell the first year PhD students, I just saw them last week, after five years, pretend that I'm going to take your degree away and say, psych, and you have to have had enough of 
a good time and have learned enough and had a great experience that it still would have been worth it. And if and it's a, the, the degree is a scaffolding for you to, to do this. And it's actually air cover so your parents don't worry about you. That you're, 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 you're getting an MIT degree. But in fact, you're here to learn, to be creative, to have fun. And if you're so focused on your degree that you're not doing this, then, then you've failed. And I think that, that the credentialing process is an, is an artifact. It is what kind of allows um, kids to come to the Media Lab and, and do this thing because society says it's okay. But once they get in, they realize that that, that, that I mean, again, they still have to complete the degrees, but it's, it's not the main thing. I do think credentialing is, is really an interesting problem because in the job market, credentialing is still important and it's, it's still part of kind of, it's like, it's, where the, it's like real life. It's like, I don't want to think about money, but it's kind of nice to have. It's like credentials are the same thing. And the fact that I don't have a college degree is kind of cool when you're in America, but I can't get a visa in Singapore. I can't start a company in the UAE. And there's so many places where not having a degree actually hurts you. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's reality. But having said that, I think that it's you, you, the, the really smart kids that I have. Like the difference between the MIT Media Lab kids and me is that they're interested in everything just like me, except they've got a, a PhD in all of them. You know. Hi, Mark Monchak from the Opportunity Lab. Uh, you talked about the ability of an entrepreneur to just go and do something and be fearless. Um, Malcolm Gladwell has a, an article a couple years ago called The Short Thing, and he sort of debunked the idea that great entrepreneurs are uh, risk tolerant. And mm -hmm. he studied Ted Turner and a lot of other entrepreneurs, and he, he believes basically entrepreneurs are extremely risk averse, but because they're risk averse, they actually do crazy, wild, incredibly creative things like Ted Turner did. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the balance of yeah. Yeah. risk aversion with risk tolerance? Well, so I, th I would translate a little bit. I would say risk insensitivity is bad. So, so risk, risk is, is so it's an interesting thing. So I remember in Japan there was a f government fund and they said they were going to invest in equities. And I said, well, what are you going to invest in? They're going to invest, we're going to invest in the sure things. <laughs> and so they bought Rockefeller Center and then, but, but, but the thing is like there's no, nothing more risky than things that look like they have no risk, right? And no, and I remember there's a book, there's a silly book that I read called The Nature of Risk, and, and, there, and, and, and there's a term in Wall Street where they say the information is in the price, right? So, so what happens is, like, if I look at a startup company, and I'm going to think this is now as an investor, what I want to do is I want to find something that has tremendous risk, like a fierce company that I, I was working with, but somebody has tremendous risk, but if I can value that risk more accurately than anyone else, that means I can buy it low because I know that everybody else is freaked out. They don't want to take this risk, even though there's tremendous risk. But I know that there's a little less risk than everybody else thinks, so I can buy it at a 50% discount. And then once that company gets into the newspaper, everybody wants to get into the company. Well, you know, when those people who are reading the newspaper are buying, somebody's selling. And that better be me, right? And so the nature of risk is you buy low and sell high. And in every kind of risk, no matter how high the risk is, there's always a chance that it might be successful. Right? And so it's about whether you take that risk or not. There's always tremendous risk, and you've got to be really smart about it. And you've got to also be able to sell that thing when it's at high risk, so, so at low risk. And so the, the whole point is whether the price and the cost of taking that risk is you can predict it accurately or not. So, so every single venture I start out, I know it may fail, and it probably will. But I'm, I'm doing that. And so, so, so like, I, I mean, normally if, I've, if you fail 10 companies in a row, which is the, my first beginning of my career, you would give up. And it's not that I was becoming risk in, insensitive or intolerant, or, or I mean tolerant. It was just like I was starting to figure it out. And I said, okay, now I get that. Now I realize that um, cash flow matters. Oh, now I realize that the, if your postage exceeds their, your, your, your margin, that doesn't work. So P&Ls matter. And then every time I felt like, okay, now I know enough, now I know enough. But, so I may be stupid, but I was trainable. And, and so, so, but then at the end, it really is about understanding and being comfortable with risk, which is different from being um, ins insensitive, I think. Thank you. I'm June Klein. We met uh, a year ago at the Oxford Internet Symposium. 
and I was presenting the fifth state mega trend, which in short is what the internet was 10 years ago. Uh, you talked about um, what college students, PhD students should be doing. I'd like to translate that a little further into people who have to make money in order to eat, and um, particularly uh, the baby boomers, which are huge, and uh, the people who are not really trained for today's environment in terms of change. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I'd like to know, how do you become one of those non-Fortune 500 um, uh, people who belong to your MIT Media Lab? And secondly, how can I do with you an unconference uh, specifically on Fifth Estate Communications, which covers the whole continuum going from New York Times through blogs, through entertainment, through music, the whole nine yards making yourself accountable through the internet, and specifically on uh, Fifth Estate movements, but positive movements versus necessarily a WikiLeaks or an Arab Springs or, or English riots. So first, I don't think age has a lot to do with it. Um, and, I mean, in in. I've been given an opportunity. The opportunities you talked about were if I wanted to get a PhD, I could go in and take a risk. You haven't mentioned any that related to somebody who is in business. Well, there's a couple of things. So if you, so to be very local for a second, so we have no age or academic requirement to become a student at the Media Lab, and we pay our students a stipend. You may not be able to go out to your fancy dinner every night, but all of our students get paid a stipend, and we really literally have no age discrimination. And many of our, our, our collaborators and partners are, are actually, you, you have, you, you, you can't, you, you've got to have the will and the capacity, but I, but I find, you know, like I just went to the 90th birthday party of one of my mentors, and, and he's still as creative and as crazy as ever. We've, we've got Marvin Minsky still hangs out at the lab, Nicholas Negroponte still works at the lab, and they're, they're in, insanely creative. And so to me, I don't think it's about age. And in fact, some of these young undergrads, I have to spend more time deprogramming them um, of their education, especially the MBAs, than, than, I, than, I, than I do some of these you know, older, older um, inventors who come in and, and, and want to hang out at the lab. And, 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 and you can hang out at the lab. I mean, you, there's a variety of different ways to interact with the lab. You can just come and visit. You can come to one of our workshops. We're going to do a future journalism workshop here in New York in December. So there's a lot. We have a lot of surface area in which to interact. And so, depending, it can be by theme. You can come in through your company. But you just, it's about having an open mind. And and the the thing about the Media Lab is, it's all about because we use undirected research funds. Um, it's all a competition of ideas. So if you come to the Media Lab, and you have an interesting idea. The students and the faculty can go run with you all they want. If you come in and no one's interested, no matter how much money you pay us, we're not interested. And so the, the companies that we're trying, that, that hang out at the lab, it's not all about being um, famous shiny companies. It's really about the kind of attitude of the, of the, of the people in the company. And, and again, it's hard because if you're kind of stuck in, in a, in a risk-adverse, old-fashioned mode, even if you have um, money, it, it's hard. It's, it's hard. But, um, but on the other hand, when you interact, you sort of get a little bit of the DNA on you, and the part of it is just just interacting. But we're going to try to create more of a network. So I'm, I'm, and this is this I haven't announced yet, but I guess we're streaming, so it's sort of an announcement. But we're trying to create a fellows network where we will be um, trying to engage people in all these different types of communities to have access to the lab, and then to become our ambassadors in different communities. Because right now it's still somewhat academic the way you get in. I'm trying to make a way to interact with the lab in a in a slightly less academic and more um, diverse and open way. Yeah, so that was one of the questions I was going to ask is how did, do you get involved in a sort of a low budget way without being a sponsor? Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the main avenue? That, that so, so the fellow program will be one way. Mm -hmm. um, um, the other way is, you know, we were starting to do events in different places. Um, so we can start collaborating on events. Um, but I, I, you know, and, and right now, we, a lot of our corporate sponsors are these big companies that can spend a lot of money. I'm trying to bring individual philanthropists in. I'm trying to bring foundations in. The thing neat about foundations is they may sponsor 
um, you know, interactions with different types of communities and things like that. I'm trying to work with you know, small and local governments. I'm trying to work with schools. I'm trying to work with libraries. I'm trying to work where I'm spending a whole bunch of energy right now in Detroit. Um, and we're working with uh, you know, um, kids who have been in, in incarcerated. We're working with urban farmers. And so there's a, there's a bunch of different communities that haven't been typical Media Lab um, stakeholders that I'm trying to pull into our, our, our community. Howard Sterling. Uh, the Nobel Prize winner from Israel, Daniel Kahneman, wrote a great book, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, where he divides system one thinking, what we do 95% of the time, that's quick, bump, bump, mm -hmm. we'll move, and that's slow, difficult thinking. From what I hear, you have a third way of thinking. <laughs> and I don't know what the goal is, three. Mm -hmm. But building on that model, can you describe how you, I, I think you're trying to integrate system one and system two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could you describe that? Yeah, I, you know, I think that, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I haven't read the book, so I don't know if I'm going to make the perfect parallel, and I will try to read that book. I, I, I think that having a trajectory and an arc is really important. This is what I call compasses. And you can think about it as a long-term thinking, but it's also, it's two pieces. And, 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 and I, to, to use an Israeli example, I mean, um, and uh, Ophir and I have talked about this before, but the really neat thing about, um, to use a military metaphor, I mean, really good military units is that they have enough kind of general direction of what they're supposed to do. Actually, fire departments are really good. So after the earthquake in Japan, all these different groups went in. And they were a mess. They had plans. They didn't work. But then, I, and everybody was so disillusioned. But then I saw the press release, the press conference of the fire department. And it was, a, it was this kind of silly name. It was called the Hyper Rescue Unit of the Tokyo Fire Department. But they went in and they said, okay, we didn't have a plan, but this happened. And Joe did that. And I did that. And we went left. And he went right. And we, we figured it out. And we came out. And... What's neat is, like, a, the fire department, they have a very straightforward, simple mission. You save people, go forward, do this. They're well trained, but they have, and they have fundamental values that work. And so they're able to be very agile and, and resilient in just about any kind of situation. And they don't have a plan. You know? and, and, and for me, that, that's a slight metaphor for, for instance, if... if um, let, me, let me take a different tack. So, so I, I've talked to uh, Rolf Hur at CERN. And CERN has a huge mission. They need, they're building super colliders and trying to um, identify you know, new particles. But he and I found so much similarity between what the Media Lab does and what he does, because they invented the World Wide Web, they invented all this other crazy stuff. So you can kind of go about it in two ways. You can actually have a very long-term, very specific mission, but you can create a tremendous amount of diversity because that gives you a platform. The way that I'm doing this with this kind of anti-disciplinary mess is also a different way of creating a platform that gives people freedom. But it, but so, so there are different ways of ending up in the same place, which is giving people permission to act and think without asking permission. Because it, it, and, and so there, you, you have different ways of creating that scaffolding. Um, the, 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 the other important part is this um, short and long thinking. So again, I'm going to use it like a spiritual metaphor, but like... Um, I can't remember who said this either, but you know, like some people think about golf as the score, and so that to them, golf is that moment when the ball falls into the hole, and that's all they remember. And there's other people who remember the walking part of golf, right? There's a great book called Golf in the Kingdom about this, but but it's like if you're starting to measure yourself based on these outcomes and these specific goals, basically goal-oriented thinking um, tends to make you not present and not aware, but there's so much that you learn from being aware, and this, this gets, now I'm going to go spiritual for a second, so, so this is like, in, in, in the Dalai Lama talks about this a lot, but it's, it's like success and happiness in kind of the Western sense is always about like more money, goal-oriented stuff, and the problem with that is you're never actually ever happy, and once you buy a fancy car, the next day you've adjusted and you're not happy, and you keep going, going, going. There's a more systems thinking in Buddhism, which is like if you have a good family, in a good community, you're happy. Having twice as many family doesn't make you twice as happy. And so you try to focus on the kind of systems that make you happy rather than these goals that make you happy. I am trying to adapt that to the Media Lab, which is that... And sorry, I'm going to take your question and take off onto a tangent, but I think it's important is, is that a lot of science and technology has been about 
triumph over nature and controlling nature. And it was like, how do I use my brain to, to manage this local thing that I'm doing in order to maximize my return, thinking nothing about what the effect on the environment of the system is. But there's a very different way of thinking, which is how can I use science and technology to integrate myself into to, to nature, to learn from nature, to become part of a system. It's much more of a systems thinking. And, and I think that, that it's kind of like, I think that in, in, the, in, in, in ecology and environment, we are sort of getting there. It's still a little bit top down. But I think there's like a fundamental design principle that like, it, I'm from Japan and we have Shinto in Japan. And Shinto is all, is all about taking care of your little mountain, taking care of your little elements of your, it's, it's an animistic religion. But it's, it's, but it's interesting because the whole idea is, is how can you use your energy to integrate yourself into nature rather than kind of how can you cut this hedge to s sort of show how much control you have over nature and and I, and I think that we've gotten to the point with systems biology with the understanding of networks we have the math science and technology now to think in terms of systems and so one of the things I'm trying to do is to create a, a, a design sort of methodology so that every time you create a technology you, you, you have to think about what its net effect on the system is. And, and I think that, that that's, that's, to me, is, is an important way of thinking. Well, that, that sounds like there's a, a, a thing in Zen of the Zen cook whose knife never needs sharpening because, because he cuts the meat where it wants to be cut. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I, one of the things that I'm sort of getting about what you're talking about is that, you know, uh, a startup has no funding, so, you know, or very little funding, so they're completely unrestricted in what it is that they can do. And at the other end of the scale, you have these huge entities, and frankly, MIT sort of classifies this as, you talk about how the money that you get is unrestricted funding. Um, I used to work at Bell Labs um, years ago. You know, AT&T was a monopoly, and a certain percentage of that money just went into Bell Labs to, to mm -hmm. you know, they were doing whatever it was. You know, Arno Penzias was looking at background radiation and things like that. You know, um, and, and so I guess my question is, what about the huge, you know, middle in there where, you know, you have some money. I, I mean, the, the, the creativity that you're talking about that, that comes from this sort of freedom from uh, restrictions, I think, you know, most of what the, you know, the sort of the mm -hmm. gray little man and a gray little job kind of thing, you know, I mean, most of the people <laughs> like uh, are, 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 the, are the, those of us that are out there, yeah. you know, how, how do we inject the kinds of thinking that you're doing into, into what the vast majority of people in this well, country are doing? Well, I think it's about giving permission. So uh, the, the great case is the, um, the 3M scotch tape case. Do you know this one? So scotch tape was created by, I think it was a sales guy. Um, and it used to be a sandpaper company, 3M. And, and he said that they need a adhesive. And, and, and the company told, and this, this isn't in all the histories, but there are a few history versions that say this, that the company told him not to work on this, you're, you're not to do this. And he was completely disobedient and he invented scotch tape, which saved the company. And or turn the company into this next level. And so they implemented this policy that said non-R&D people can do R&D, um, and that's how the post-it was created. You know, and it was really, and it wasn't that they gave, created a little Bell Labs, it was kind of the opposite. That if, even if you're a salesperson, if you come up with an idea, if you have passion, you're allowed to pursue it. And so the Google's 20% time is, a, is, a, is, a, is an iteration on, on, on this, um, thing that 3M has. And so a lot of the companies that come to the Media Lab, they may be people who have lines of business, but what I, I not only encourage but almost try to mandate is if you come to the Media Lab and you see something that's interesting to you, even if it's not your core line of business, I want to make sure that you have permission to pr pursue that because it really is the ability for somebody to become passionate about something. And, and you do have the Edisons of the world who are just these streams of passion. And that's kind of what we're trying to attract as the core faculty of the Media Lab. But, but I think everybody has the potential and the opportunity to think of something. And a lot of this is about serendipity. You may be the, like, there's, there's a great um, study of, do you know Innocentive? So, so there's a study on Innocentive. So for those of you who don't know Innocentive, it's a place where people put in challenges, like um, PNG saying, how do I get more, how do I most easily get um, toothpaste into toothpaste tubes? And I think it was an HVAC guy or somebody completely unrelated that said, hey, maybe you can ionize the particles and then you can suck them in. And what they did was they did a study and they showed that most of the great answers to the hardest questions came from people who weren't in the domains of those questions. And, it, and, and, and um, um, 
uh, Scott Page writes about this in his in book called Difference, about showing that diversity is important. But, but I think that that's kind of what it is. If you've got a, a set of skills and a way of thinking, and you start having your peripheral vision open, if you come to the Media Lab or anywhere else, and you see an opportunity and you're able to connect it, that's when the real sparks fly. I mean, it's not the only way you become creative, but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's what we're trying to encourage. And so I would say that the, everyone has a capacity, as long as they, uh, on the weekends or wherever, you take your blinders off and you look around. And right now, again, getting back to the point, my original point, that the cost of trying something is so cheap now that there really isn't an excuse for, for ha having to wait until you get into the research lab. You started talking about the creativity that someone in kindergarten has and how that's gone um, <coughs> later in life. And as the world is flat and nations are competing with each other over talent, if you were granted the right to design primary education in different countries, you were able to advise them, what should we do to keep that creativity? What advice would you give someone in designing a primary education in, in any country? So, so this is actually my sister's field of research, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit, no. so, she, so she, she, became, she became an expert in education and anthropology in double PhD and then she looked over and she saw me and realized that I had somehow stumbled through and been able to survive without formal education so she tried she st actually started studying how I survived and then came up with this theory um, and um, yeah, no no but but um, but I'm her subject but but um but, but I think what's important is, um, and the way that she just, she has a book called um, Hanging Out, Messing Around, Geeking Out. And her theory is that kids today, um, so first of all, the most important thing is getting people to want to learn. Because now there are actually so many ways to learn once you want to learn, but most kids don't learn because they don't want to learn. It's not that they are completely um, unable to. With the internet, you can actually, I learn most of what I learned either through the internet or through people I met on the internet. The only thing I learned in school that was useful was typing. And, um, but the way you do this is you get people motivated who have passion and then you actually don't need to do a lot of the stuff that you think you need in education. And so, so her hanging out part is what it turns out is like if you're hanging out with some kids and say, what are you doing? Um, and then you say, can I look? And then you say, hey, let me mess around with that. And then suddenly you start geeking out. So it's, the, the hanging out part is how do kids peer to peer get other kids interested in new things. And once they're interested in new things, you start messing around together and then you've got them hooked. And then they go home and they study and they study. And you can see this in video games like StarCraft and things like that. But it turns out it happens in math, it happens in craft, it happens in all these different things. And so she's an anthropologist who's been studying how do you get kids interested in peer to peer learning and peer teaching and things like that. And so to me, I think one of the biggest, so I look at my background and I always had adult mentors. I, the, it was whether it was a um, the pet store guy or the the, the Dungeons and Dragons um, dungeon master. But all of my my mentors were adults. And it, the problem right now with schools is that they have these weird age delineated um, sort of fear of adult sort of locked down kids who don't get to go out much. And so you get this kind of Lord of the Flies thing going on at every, every age where it's about the popularity contest and, and the kids' focus is really on this really limited space. And so one of the things I think is going to be how do you safely allow kids to interact with adults? Um, how do you make it cool to geek out? How do you get kids to interact outside of school? And, and then how do you also give... I think one of the other big stigmas is video games and all these other things are considered bad because the parents don't understand them. But if you look at StarCraft and the community around StarCraft, it's a very rich version of what chess is, you know, it's about mentoring and teaching and the community and stuff like that. So I, I think really what you, and, and if you look at Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, you get these kids teaching each other across ages and things like that. Well, it turns out that the communities that these kids have created to teach each other rules about Pokemon are actually translatable to how kids teach each other about computers and teach each other about coding and teach each other about math. And they realize that they teach each other better than they learn from the teacher. And so if you take the teacher out of the mix and you, you allow kids to peer-to-peer -to -peer teach, and then the other part is to stop age delineation, um, age segregation. So, if you, so what I would do for primary schools is I would get rid of the shop class and the art class and all that, make one single 
creative class where you would spend one third of your time working with kids across ages, just building stuff. And it was just all about building whatever you wanted to do. And, 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 and it's like a little kindergarten class, but you put that sort of in the middle of the day. And then you would say, oh, I'm going to learn chemistry because I want to do this thing here. And I'm going to learn this because I want to do this. I, I'm a scuba instructor. And one of the things as a scuba instructor, you've, what's wonderful is like, well, you've got to learn Boyle's Law because in, a week, in, a, in an hour we're going to be using it in the pool. If you're not good at that, you're going to sink when we're over there. And like, and the, the, the most anti-school kids, I can, by the end of the scuba thing, they know physics, they know chemistry, they know, you know biology, and it's about the application of this stuff that is, and again, your mileage may vary. Some kids will study without having any of that incentive, but my guess is that the majority of kids will learn a lot more if you tell them within an hour, you're gonna be using this do X. And so that's the practice over theory. I think that this kind of lab, Tinkering space is, a, is an essential part of primary education. Well, I so. think we're over the time we have, and this is a very Woo! nice place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.